Hello, guys. This is your friend Paul McCorder from thebibleboy.com, and we're here today with episode number 19 in our Let's Talk series, where we get together and talk about all matters associated with biblical faith and really kind of a theme about these teachings that I'm doing or these discussions, really, it's discussions that we're having is kind of about how to live cleanly in a really dirty world. And that's sort of been an emerging theme in our teaching. And so we're going to continue that teaching today. And what I'm going to be talking to you today about is biblical giving. Now, before you <laughs> click off, go somewhere else, understand I am not asking you for money. Understand, I do not take donations. Understand, look down in the description. There is not, there is not any link over to my PayPal account. I am not asking for donations. It is not possible for you to give me a donation. Now, why do I go to such great links to let you know that I am not asking for money? And that is because this topic of biblical giving or tithing is probably one of the most mistaught, one of the most mistaught principles in all of Christianity. And it's also, because it's so mistaught, it's also one of the most mispracticed, one of the most mispracticed principles in all of Christianity. And so usually when you hear a teaching on this topic, it is coming from a person who wants money, okay? And so like if you think about the congregation of a church as a wet rag and the church needs money, it's just sitting there thinking about how it can squeeze some money out of the congregation. And usually when a church has a teaching on tithing, it's because they have a financial need. And usually the teaching that is given on the uh, topic of tithing or Christian giving, usually it's based on one of two things. The first is it's based on guilt, okay? You are taught that you owe money to God, okay? You owe money to God and that, you know, God has given you so much and you're not giving anything back and therefore, you know, they build you up and, and, and they basically guilt you. And yeah, you can, you can, you can make people feel guilty and actually, you can raise a lot of money by making people feel guilty. And so that's kind of like the first trick that's used is you go out, you pick out some verses and you make people feel really guilty because they're not giving and you're able to wring a little bit of water out of that wet rag, okay? And I'll get into this teaching a little bit later, but I'll give you a heads up right now. If you're giving based on guilt or you're giving based on legalism, you're just sort of wasting your time. It is not a gift that pleases God. So if we're not supposed to give out of guilt, what is the second way that giving is taught? Well, the second way giving is taught, and this one can raise a lot of money, and that's based on greed. That you're taught that somehow by giving, it's kind of like buying a lottery ticket, okay? You throw some money in the plate, and then you sit back, and then you let God open the storehouses of heaven and just rain money down on you. And so we're giving not because we love God. We're not giving because we love our neighbor. We're giving because we're greedy, and we think that if we give this, right? How many sermons have you heard? You plant this seed. You know, the sower has to have the seed. You plant this seed and then God will get, send you the harvest. And, and of course, it's like somehow you give money to this guy. You know, you know, they talk about giving to God, giving to God, giving to God. But then, by the way, the way you give to God is to send it to me and then God will send the harvest. And so it's based on greed. And really, that is a very terrible heresy because you're kind of talking about their uh, sort of an Eastern religion, sort of like a karma. If you do something good, then something good happens back to you. And that's not a biblical concept. It's not a biblical concept at all. And so the chances are most of the things that you have been taught on giving are not biblical. Most of it has either been trying to guilt you into giving, or it has been to get you greed to give you, get you to give based on greed, guilt or greed, guilt or greed. Okay. And both of those are wrong. Well, if we're not supposed to give out of guilt and we're not supposed to give out of greed, what is it that we are supposed to give out of? 
And what I can tell you is it's grace. We give out of grace. And so let me read you a verse here that I think is just a really, really cool verse. And that verse is 2 Corinthians 9. And we're going to go from 6 through 9. And uh, while you're looking that up, I'll have a sip of co coffee. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 9. Okay, and if we go there on my screen here, I apologize. The first little part of the sentence is on the previous page, but it says, He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, but he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Okay, he who uh, sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he is dispersed abroad, he is given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. And let me just read that last little part there. Let me get the title out of the way. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Okay, so this is saying that God provides to those who give. Okay, but he provides so they can give more. And this is kind of this is kind of the wrong mindset, right? It's, 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 it's like, okay, this is, is the typical greed mindset. And that is, and a lot of times this verse is, is, is really taught out of context. It's like, man, I really want that Ford King Ranch. I, I don't know. I don't keep track of vehicles, but I think Ford makes the King Ranch, and that's that big pickup that is all flashy and costs sixty-five or seventy thousand dollars or whatever. Oh man, I want that King Ranch, and I can drive it around. And everybody can see me, but I really can't quite afford it. But man, I really want that, and I think God wants me to have it. So I'm going to throw a little bit in the offering plate in the hopes that God will then provide so I can get that King Ranch. No, no. No, that is giving based on greed, hoping that you will get something back. But the way it works is, is that you give, okay? And you give what you can't afford and you give what hurts. And then God takes that and he sees that you gave based on grace, okay? And he sees that you gave that based on a cheerful heart. And he sees you gave that out of love. And then he takes it and he blesses other people with it. And then after he blesses other people with it, then he returns to you so you can give even more, all right? No King Ranch anywhere in this equation. Yes, he provides seed for the sower. Why? So that they can sow more. Does that make sense? Okay. So I think sort of like biblical giving, and if we look at this verse, I'd say there's kind of three things that we that we should see. First of all, we should see that all we have is because of God's grace. Everything that we have including that last breath that we took, is a gift from God. Everything is a gift from God, and it comes from God because of God's grace. Secondly, because of God's grace, we are given the faith to give. Okay, we If we're giving because we're trying to follow a rule, or we're that's legalism. If we're giving because we think that then God will hook us up with a bunch of money so we can get this pickup that we want. That is giving based on greed. But God wants it to give, wants us to give because of a heart, okay? A generous heart. He wants us to be cheerful givers. And so what we can see is God has already given us. God has already given us what we need in order to give back. That's already done. Okay, the second thing that we've got to see is God offers to give us the grace that we need in order to have the faith 
in order to give. Now, that's something that maybe some of us have not reach and reached out and taken a hold of. And how do we do that? Well, we do that through prayer. God, give me give me a generous heart. Give me the heart of a cheerful giver. He is offering that great grace to us, but we've got to reach out and we've got to take it. And then finally, what we've got to see is by God's grace, he gives us all good things and he rewards our faith. And so when we take that faith and then we, we give, okay, he rewards us for it, but he rewards us so we can give more so that we can have the things that we need. We'll have the food that we need. We'll have all the things that we need, but then we'll have an abundance. Why? So we can give back, okay, so that we can give back. Now, what I'll say is, is that really, okay, you know, this, this topic of tithing, it's something that churches teach wrong, right? We talked about that. They teach based on trying to guilt you into giving them your money, okay? And then the second thing is, it's based on greed that if you give money to me, you know, I'm the church or I'm the televangelist or whatever, you give money to me and then God is going to uh, bless you abundantly and then you can go buy all of these things that you want. All right. Well, if, if, if it's being taught wrong, then what you can imagine is it's being practiced wrong. All right. The first uh, thing is most people just don't give at all. Right. And I'll go into the different different reasons that people have for not giving. And then the second thing is, is that those that are giving are either giving based on greed well, God's not going to honor that. He sees your heart when you're giving. If you're giving just because you think that you're going to get something good back, that's not going to honor God. That doesn't bless God. He's not going to he's not going to reward that. And the second thing is you could be giving based on guilt. Well, he doesn't love that. He doesn't love a guilty heart. He loves a cheerful giver, okay? And so a lot of people that are giving are giving for the wrong reason and are giving in a way that God is not going to honor and God is not going to bless. Okay. But the truth is most people don't give at all or give just very stingily, like just drop a little, you know, throw a little coin in the offering plate and okay, there I've check the box I gave. Giving with a grudging heart or giving out of legalism, God's not going to honor that either. So let's look at some of the reasons that people don't give. One of the biggest reasons is because they think the church wastes the money. And I'm not going to give to the church because the church spends too much money on pizza. And I went out to the youth uh, the youth building on Wednesday night and they had 80 pizzas. They're sitting there and they're spending $1,000 a week on pizza. And it's just a big waste. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, so let me ask you, do churches oftentimes waste money? Yes, unfortunately they do, okay? But that is between them and God. God calls us to give. God calls us to support the local church. And we will stand before God one day and, and, and give account for what we did with the money that he gave us. And, and, and sort of like saying that the church was wasting money, that, uh -uh, that's not going to cut it. Okay, because God calls on us to give. Now, someday leaders in that church might be held accountable for God for what they did with the money that his people provided. But you can't try to short circuit God and say, well, they're buying too much pizza. Therefore, I am not going to give. And I will give you a biblical example for that. Remember in Matthew, when Jesus went into the temple and he saw the little widow and the widow dropped two coins, two little copper coins in the offering plate, and he pointed out her generosity, and he said that for all the rest of human history, this woman would be remembered for her generosity. He saw it. He honored it. He blessed it. He made her, you know, gave her a place among the, the saints as far as uh, the heroes of the faith for this thing that she did. Now, I want you to think about something. What is the most corrupt church that ever existed on the face of the earth? has to be the temple 
at Jerusalem at the time of Jesus. Why? Because they crucified Jesus. As far as we know, those two copper coins that she put in were used to buy the nails that were put in Jesus's hands. Okay, now I know it was really the Romans who did it, but the Jews turned them over. The leadership of that church, the high priest and the, the leaders of that church handed Jesus over for crucifixion, yet Jesus commended this lady for giving her money to the temple. Okay, so be careful, my friend, of using the excuse of you don't like the way the church is being managed and therefore you are not going to give. Very, very dangerous thing. Now, what I do encourage you to do, I encourage you to find the best church that you can in your area, a good Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church, and one that has honorable men that do the best they can to be led by God and led by the Holy Spirit and led by Scripture to lead the church in a godly fashion. Okay, yeah, find the best church that you can, but you're not going to find the perfect church. And what you've got to understand is God accomplishes his perfect will and his perfect purpose through imperfect churches and imperfect people. And I'm kind of like a perfect example of it. I hate to say this, and I have repented of this, but I went to a church for 17 years that was one of these seeker-sensitive Rick Warren-style churches. It was sort of like, kind of like prosperity gospel light. It would be sort of like a Joel Olstein light church, and it was just all happiness and, and 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 goodness and just all this, you know, happy little messages and 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 really a lot of kind of like prosperity gospel type of stuff. But you know what? In that church, there was a guy, and that guy was like a really really solid Christian. Christian, and he pulled me aside and he discipled me for 17 years, okay? And so much of who I became as a, you know, as a follower of Jesus Christ was because of the teaching and because of the discipleship and because of the investment that that guy made in me who was at this church that was not so hot. So God accomplishes his perfect will, even in imperfect churches. Find the best one you can, but don't start giving excuses for not giving because, uh, excuses for not giving because you don't think the church is managing things well. That's not good. Okay. Uh, one reason uh, that people don't give is they think that, that churches are wasting their money. Another reason people don't give is there's this strange one. I heard somebody like was arguing this with me one day, and that is, is that tithing is legalism. And if you tithe, then you're putting yourself under the law. And if you put yourself under the law in one area, then you've got to meet all the law. It was like trying to say that like somehow the fact that you are obedient and give and have a cheerful spirit to give that somehow you're putting yourself under the law. And so he didn't give and he didn't give it all because, because not because what he was doing was he was rationalizing and he heard this little argument and it really resonated with him because then he could use sort of like a biblical, a twisted, you know, out of context, biblical sort of manipulation to then rationalize why he wasn't giving. Now, the strange thing was this guy, he was making like $40,000 a month. He like had one of these, I don't know, it wasn't, it, it was like one of these sort of like mercenary type jobs for the government where like you go into this really dangerous situation, they pay you this insanely high amount of money. This guy was making like $40,000 a month, but he was a stingy man, a stingy man, and he wouldn't give anything. And you know what? He had all the toys, you know, he had all the toys in the world, but he was a miserable man. And I saw him lose his family. I saw his family break apart. And now all he's got is his toys. And you know what he's learning? His toys aren't that much fun. It's really a heartbreaking story, a really, really heartbreaking story. But he was a stingy man. But he used this crazy argument that it's legalism if you think that you should tithe. That's just not true. God wants us to be generous. God wants us to give. Church needs to be supported. The church is the instrument that God uses on the earth to accomplish his will. Okay, churches aren't perfect, but we do need to give. Okay, now one of the biggest reasons 
that we don't give is because we can't afford it. Now, one of the things is I think a lot of times like a guy, like somebody that that feels like they're really under a lot of financial pressure and they see this guy in the church and, oh yeah, well that guy gives a lot because he's rich. Okay, he's rich so he can give a lot. Like when I have enough, I'll give. This is the faultiness of your logic. You are assuming that that rich man waited until he was rich to give. And what I can guarantee you is when that rich man started out poor and when he was trying to get his business started and when he didn't know how he was going to make payroll and when it was the lowest spot in his life, you know what he did? He gave. <laughs> he tithed. And because he was faithful at those hardest times, God blessed him. And now he's a wealthy man. And now he gives even more. He gives even more abundantly. Okay. But you see, the problem is a lot of kind of like you stingy people are not giving with the excuse of you can't afford to give. But what you got to see is the people that can afford and are giving, they started when they couldn't afford it. And let me kind of give you a verse there. And this really, man, I love this because it really is sort of like the picture of Christian giving. It's a picture of Christian giving. And what that verse is, 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 is Matthew 14 and 13. And that is not it. Okay, that is not it. That is it. Okay. And this is kind of a, a famous, this is a very famous and very familiar verse. It's the feeding of the 5,000. But I want, I want us to read this and kind of think about this in the context of giving. And so what it says is when Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude and he was moved with compassion for them and he healed their sick. When it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the village and buy themselves food. But Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And he said to them, and, and they said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fishes. He said to them, bring them here. Then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples, and the disciples gave to the multitudes. So they all ate and were filled, and they took up 12 basketfuls of fragments that remained. Okay, 12 baskets that remained. So let's ask ourselves, how much food did the 12 disciples have? Okay, they had five loaves and two fish. So if there's five loaves for 12 people, each one's getting like a third of a loaf. Each one, like for, for that day, do they have enough food for that day? You want to talk about full, poor, they didn't have enough food to feed themselves that day. Like you think of a little loaf like this, they, each one was going to get a third of the loaf. And if they had two fish for 12 people, you're just going to get a little tiny sliver of fish. They were, they had nothing. Okay. They had nothing. They did not have enough to feed themselves. Okay. Did Jesus say, oh man, God, you guys, let's go find someone rich because you guys, you don't, you don't have enough food for today. Let's go find someone rich. No. What did he do? He told him to give it to him. And what did they do? They gave it to him. And what did he do? He took it. When he took it, they were left with what? Nothing. Nada. Zilch. They had nothing. And they think, man, it was going to be tough dividing this 12 ways. We're going to divide it 5,000 ways. I'm going to be lucky to get a crumb. I'm not eating today. Okay. But what did they do? They obeyed. And they gave what they had. 
and they gave sacrificially, and they gave based on faith. Okay, and we're going to assume when they did this, also they did it with a with a cheerful heart. Okay, that what we have we're going to give, and let's hope it does something good. So they gave, Jesus took, and when he took it, what did he do? He blessed it, and he multiplied it, and he blessed others with it, okay? He multiplied what was given, and he blessed other people, and then what? He returned to them more than they had given. Now, each one of them, instead of having a tiny little piece of, of bread, and, and just a smidgen of fish. Each one of them, 12 baskets, each one of them had a basket of food. What would a basket of food be in this context more than they could eat? Okay, so they went from not having enough to having more than they could eat. Why? Because they gave obediently and they gave with a cheerful heart. And because of that, God, God took it, Jesus took it, he blessed it, he multiplied it, he blessed others, and then he returned to them more than he had taken. Okay, and that is a picture, I think, of biblical giving. Okay, we give when we can't afford it, and we give our best, and we give with a cheerful heart. Okay, now another thing is that we kind of think is this, this idea that, that when we give, this idea that, that, that when we give, that then we're going to get what we want. Okay, and a lot of verses are taken out of context, but let me uh, let me come over here to this one, which is Psalm. Uh, that is not it. This is kind of trial and error. Psalm thirty-seven four, and I think this is really just like that verse in Matthew is just really really instructional when it comes to biblical giving, and this one this one is really good too. So this is Psalm thirty-seven four. And, or I'm going to start in Psalm 37, 3. It says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Does, delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Okay, understand this isn't one of those do this, check the box, get rich, get what you want. Like, okay, now I want that, again, that King Ranch pickup. Okay, well, if I do this, I need to trust in the Lord. Okay. Dear God, I trust in you, and I need to do good. Okay, I'm going to run, and I'm going to give this little thing, and then I'm going to feed. Okay, I'll do this, and now I'm going to get everything I want. No, that's not what it's saying. Okay, trust in the Lord, dwell in the land, and feed on his faithfulness. What does that mean? Time in the word, time in prayer, seeking God, seeking that secret place of the Most High to be in fellowship with him. Okay, delight ourselves in the Lord. And then what does he do? He gives us the desires of our heart. And really, you could think of this as, is that he puts the desires in our heart. He changes our heart. He changes what we want. We no longer want that King Ranch pickup. What we want is we want to be in close fellowship with him. We want to serve him. We want to honor him. We want to bring glory to him. <laughs> okay. And so he gives us the desires of our heart because... When we delight in the Lord and we feed on his faithfulness, he puts those desires in our heart. And then when he fulfills them, it is a wonderful thing. You find the peace, you find the joy that you're never going to find in all these cheap trinkets that you're spending your life pursuing. Okay, you're pursuing your life, you're, you're spending your life pursuing worthless trinkets, worthless idols. And whenever you get one, you've got to get the next one and the next one. And you're just sitting there spending all of your time collecting together all of this nonsense to where if you will feed on the faithfulness of the Lord, delight in him, he will put in you the desires, which then he will fulfill. And then it is a wonderful, wonderful place to be. He will give you the things that will really fulfill you. He will not give you the things that you want that you think will make you happy. Why? Because he knows they won't make you happy. All right. He is a good father. He is a loving father. And so that is kind of a good, a good thing. All right. Now, realistically, okay, 
I mean, I'll be honest with you. I know that like a lot of you probably are in a position where you cannot afford to give. And and, and that's because you, you've kind of gotten yourself into a big mess. And that's sort of like if you do things the way everyone else does them, you're going to get the same result they do. And, and, and I'm talking about doing the same thing that everyone in the church is doing, everyone in your culture is doing, everyone in your family is doing, everyone's doing it, and you're doing it, and you're kind of getting the same lousy result. And what is that lousy result? Well, for a lot of people, you kind of have made a set of decisions in your life that have gotten you in a pickle, have gotten you in a mess. Maybe you're still struggling to pay off your student loans and your spouse's student loans. Maybe uh, you, you, you owe on your car, you've got a mortgage or you've got a big rent that you've got to make, you've got a mortgage, you've got two car payments maybe. And, and maybe as a family, you're finding yourself that you have got to work, work, work like a dog. Your wife has to work. You and your wife are having to work just to sort of meet your bills. And then as, as, as that happens, then it's sort of like, okay, your wife is so busy that she's not really cooking too much at home because she's she's got all this responsibility at work. And so you end up eating out a lot or you're eating a lot of food like ready-made food from the grocery store that's expensive and isn't very healthy. And then as you're doing all this stuff, just trying to keep your nose above water, you know that you're not being the parent that you ought to be. And so what you got to do is you got to go out and buy your kids that iPhone and you, you sort of try to make up for the time that you're not spending. It's like you got these idols and now you got to pay for them and you're working so hard to pay for them. You're you're not spending the time with your with your children that you should. So the, the, the way you respond to that is to go give your kids the iPhones and the Xboxes and all that sort of stuff. It's just like one huge, big, ugly mess. You say, well, I can't afford to give. Yeah, because you sort of created this mess. Okay, you created this mess. Guys, I know people around me, all around me, that are making between $50 and $100 a month. And you know what? I know people that are making $50 to $100 a month that are tithing. So when you say you can't afford to tithe, don't say that. Be honest with yourself. What you're saying, be honest with yourself. And if you were honest, you would say, there are things that are more important to me and I'm not tithing because I'm not willing to give up this, not willing to give up this, not willing to give up this, 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 this. All these things are more important to me than giving to God. And at least if you would be honest with that, that would be a start. Okay. And you say, well, well, it's just, I've got all these things I've already got. Well, okay. Let me give you a scenario. Let's say instead of being X, Y, Z living in the big city, what if you became a plumber and moved to Idaho or moved to West Texas and you moved to a little rural community and you were a plumber there working as a plumber and you live in a mobile home on maybe a couple of acres outside of town. And then, you know, you maybe take a four X reduction in salary, but then you're able to put yourself in a position where your wife can stay home, take care of the family. See, there is a different life out there. There is a different life out there that you are not choosing. Okay, now that's pretty radical what I just said. It's true, but probably you, a lot of you can't handle the truth. And, and the truth is God is uh, merciful. He's a good father and, and he's patient and he's forgiving. Yeah, you kind of got yourself into a pickle and maybe it's just asking too much for you to become a plumber and move to a mobile home in a rural area. Maybe that's too much, but let's see what we can do. Let's start somewhere to try to kind of get out of this mess we're in. And I'm going to just suggest something. What if, like, let me give you an example. Again, you can't give me money. Don't ask because I'm not going to take it. All right. But, but did you know that in a lot of parts of the world, there are fully trained, fully equipped pastors that are ready to go out and preach and teach and disciple and evangelize. They've been through Bible training. They've got a heart for God. And you know what they need? They could do it on a salary of $150 or $200 a month, but they are not able to go out and they are not able to do this because they don't have anybody to provide $150 or $200 a month. Okay, now this is what I want you to think about. How much are you spending on cable TV? Throw your cable, throw your TV out, cancel cable TV, cancel Netflix, and take that money and find a place to give it. Give it to God. So you can't afford it, but something you're going to give up. And when you give that up, 
you're going to give to God. And what if he blesses that? And what if it comes back in such a wonderful way that then you're trying to give more? And so you say, well, oh, this other thing over here that I thought was important, it's not so important. Okay, it's not so important. Maybe I can give it. And you start giving things up. But you're not really giving things up. You're trading worthless idols for something with eternal significance. You're trading worthless idols for something of eternal significance. And when you really get into this groove of giving, it's not a pious, sacrificial, sad life. It's a life full of abundance and full of joy because the things you're getting are worth so much more and making you so much happier than these worthless things that you're giving away. So what I would suggest as a start is, man, cancel cable TV, cancel Netflix, take that, figure out a good, worthy thing to give to based on that, and then see if God doesn't provide some wonderful things, maybe even some miraculous things, and then just start giving and giving and giving, giving more, giving more, giving more, finding more joy, finding more fulfillment, finding more meaning in, meaning in lies, and get away from this rat trap. Get away from this rat race that you find yourself in, okay? Now, that's kind of a little bit of a, that's a little bit of a, you know, sort of a suggestion of a way to get, uh, to get started. I think there's a lot of things that people could do that would be wise to, you know, sort of put your house in financial order because, when you look around the world, man, when you look around yourself and where we are right now, the world's a crazy place. And man, if I was going to give you a suggestion right now, man, it is time to get small. Get as small as you can in every area of your life. Get as small as you can. Downsize, downsize, downsize. And if this is something you're interested in, leave me feedback and maybe I could do some teachings on, you know, financial, uh, you know, being a wise steward a wise financial steward in this kind of like battening down the hatches for this time that we're in right now and i'll be honest with you uh i'm not in debt i've never been in debt the only time that i ever borrowed money in my life was when i bought my first house and it was a small house and i did the analysis that it made more sense to buy the house pay it off quickly than to rent and so financially that made sense i bought the house paid it off in five years. And so I have been debt free since 1990, something like that. I've been debt free since 1990. And it's like, the more I give, the more God gives me. And it's just like, I don't have a big fancy lifestyle, but it's just this, this lifestyle of abundance. And it's really good. And I, I could help you get there if you, if you were interested and, and would want me to teach on something like that. So anyway, guys, I just want to tell you, uh, you know, it, it's really sad, those of you who have not found this joy that I'm talking about. And I'm not preaching at you. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I'm not trying to tell you that, you know, uh, you know, any, any any kind of malarkey. I just want you to have the joy that I've found if you have not found it already. So let me kind of summarize things as far as giving goes with this, uh, with this verse. Again, I'm kind of having to hop around to try to find where my verses are. Let's see. Okay, this is it, and this is 1 Timothy 6, 17, and I'm just going to kind of summarize with this verse. Command those who are rich in this present age. Now, I know right off the bat you say, oh, well, that's not talking to me. Let me tell you, let me remind you, all the people around me make between $50 and $100 a month. So, my friend, you are rich. By historical standards and by standards of most people around the world, you are rich. So this is talking to you. It says, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good works that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. Okay, guys, it is not about legalism. It is not about having to follow a rule. It's about being a cheerful giver, ready to give, willing to share. 
Okay. I hope you guys will think about this. Man, this has been some hard stuff that I've talked about. Leave me some feedback down below. Do you guys want to hear more about, you know, kind of more things about financial uh, uh, issues, more things about trying to get our lives lined up? for this sort of like really, really crazy world that we're living in. Give me some feedback down below. If you like this video, give me a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed to the channel already, subscribe to it. Share it with other people, man. I think these things that we're talking about here are pretty important. And it's just like, I think you need to hear about giving from someone who's not asking you for money. I think that's kind of important. Okay, guys, I hope you uh, enjoy listening to these lessons as much as uh, I'm enjoying making them. And uh, if there's interest, I will keep trying to release a Bible study teaching on the weekend. So give me some give me some feedback down below. All right, guys, this is Paul McWhorter from thebibleboy.com. I will talk to you guys later.